So yes, we've had a lot of participation, especially with Western being cutworm this year. Many of you may have been involved in that trapping. Uh, some of the aphid stuff that I'm going to talk about, we, we've had other projects that are based on the host plant resistance that has been found at Michigan State University. And uh, I don't have some of that data, it's a little more esoteric, but Keith may talk about that later in the program. I hope we'll say a few words about that uh, because he's involved in the commercialization of that MSU material that was partly funded with your checkoff dollars uh, was in uh, how it was developed. So let's look at uh, the suction trap network, which is funded uh, every year by either the, uh, the North Central Soybean Group and the Michigan Group. And uh, these are the suction trap counts. Uh, we have a, two new trap locations this year that both aren't up here because the traps were moved partly through the season. One is at the new Bean and Beet Farm that has moved uh, east across Saginaw County. And the other one, uh, Martin actually runs now because he always has that crew of students that work for him in the summer. And it's at the airport in Sandusky. So I'm hoping if any of you have a small aircraft, don't hit my suction trap that's <laughs> 20 feet tall. I don't want to fill up paperwork involved in that. But we did have three traps that went all, all, all season. And um, i got to make sure I have the right little pointer thing here. Yeah, there we go. So the red line, this is Monroe County down by Cabela's. Uh, we do have the Sanilac trap that went in at least early enough, and then we have this trap here, the blue line, which is East Lansing. So for most of the field season, nothing really happened with, with aphids. But as I start going around the state, I hear about little things that happen. So down in Berrien County, there were some very late aphid populations that were treated. I suspect they were on that really light potassium deficient soil. Way up north, like way away up north by Alpena, I've heard there were some high aphid populations that, that nobody called me about. But in my plots, uh, here in, uh, at least in Saginaw County, uh, we didn't have aphid numbers until fairly late in the season. And when you get that kind of thing, the aphids are pretty healthy at the end of the season. There's not enough time for them to get fungus uh, and kill them on soybean. So you have these populations that don't look devastating on soybean, and they aren't. They're not very troublesome, but they produced a lot of winged ones that go back to the buckthorn. So you can see that here. We're not catching anything, and then we start catching right about the middle of August in our big suction traps, and then you get this big peak that was at the beginning of October, and uh, this flight was, was huge. So outside my office in East Lansing, if I went to a buckthorn tree, every single leaf looked like this. And this may not seem impressive to you, but since I look every year in buckthorn, this, this is the highest number of overwintering, potentially overwintering aphids that we have ever, ever seen. So here's a leaf. This was very typical. You see little winged ones here. Those came out of your soybean fields. And here are their children. These are now all female. <coughs> And those are going to mate with a male and lay eggs. So this is your reproductive potential, if you can imagine all the eggs. So in about early October, I, I told people before, I had kind of a pants wetting moment because I was pretty excited that, oh my gosh, <laughs> look at all these aphids. Think of all the eggs there are going to be. This is going to be huge. And every other state around us had the same thing. But then things started to happen. We had ladybugs come onto these plants. We had parasitic wasps start to attack these aphids. We had other predators beginning to accumulate. But the best thing we had turned out to be fungus again. So here's a healthy mother aphid. Here's her kids. Here's an aphid. It, it was brown. The wings are stuck straight out. That one is, is dead. She's been infected with fungus, probably back on soybean. So she flew sick from your soybean plants made it to buckthorn and just died. And when aphids die from fungus, they stick onto the leaf. And the fungus grows in this body, which we call a cadaver at that point, and then the fungus explodes out of the body and we, there's a spore shower. There's a shower of spores on this leaf. And if a, an individual aphid gets hit by a spore, the spore sticks to its body, grows through its skin essentially, and then infests its body and it will eventually kill it. So it's kind of like a gruesome case of athlete's foot, like the worst case you can possibly imagine. So here are two dead ones that again got infected back on soybean probably at the end of the year, and they were you know, healthy enough to make it to buckthorn, but they shed spores onto everybody else. 
So very rapidly, here's another picture. So here's a dead one, and here are live. Here's another one that's, a, that's about to kind of grow with its fungus. And the end result of this was the aphid population within two or three weeks completely was wiped out in October. We had a little bit of a warm spell there. There was some, a little bit of moisture. And in your fields, you were, you were probably observing like maybe some white mold and white mold and dry beans as well. Those kind of conditions at the end of the season also kill insects. Now if we start, I, I know there's a big push to use a lot of fungicides in crops. And there are very good reasons to use fungicides sometimes in soybeans if you have a problem. But if we had had a lot of fungicide use in soybean in the middle of August, not because of a disease, but just for some other purpose, plant health or whatever, you could actually have killed the fungus that infected these aphids, and you might not have had aphids die back on the buckthorn because of fungus. When you use fungicides on a crop, you not only kill the fungus that is potentially harming your, your crop, you're killing fungus that kills insects and spider mites and, and other things too. So just be aware when you go to use a fungicide, try to make sure you, that you really need it and it's not just because I'm going over the field and I'm throwing it in as a tank mix or the guy said it was cheap so I'm just going to use some or it's plant health. Sometimes you can actually create an insect problem. So the lack of fungicide use in August in a lot of places has led to this just death of all the aphids. So we started off at a huge potential risk for 2010, and that risk has just frittered away. I have yet to find eggs, but I do need to go down to the Monroe area and some of these other areas in the spring and look to see if there were any eggs at all. But the report out of Ontario, Ohio, Wisconsin, Indiana is the aphids died and the risk is, seems to be very or m much lower for 2010. I think that's my last. Are there any, are there any aphid questions? I, I'm hoping maybe Keith, when he talks in an hour or so, maybe if you have any questions about the status of the commercialization of the aphid-resistant uh, germplasm, that he'll be able to, to answer that. Yeah. Do, you, do you have this natural uh, decrease of aphids every year like this? The question was, do we have this natural decrease every year? Uh, no, it, a lot of times fungus depends on weather conditions. So you need to have the right weather conditions for that fungus to kind of take over. The other thing that happened was we had this weird aphid population at the end of the year that kind of went up late. So it was middle of August when the aphids were just beginning to kind of trail up. And a lot of those must have got infected and enough of them made it back to Buckthorn to infect everybody else. So some years we see fungus being very important, other years we don't, and it's really weather dependent. So pe people have asked, well, why don't we bottle that and sell that? And there are some crops where you can buy ent what, what we call entomopathogenic fungi, fungi that kill insects. But they only work if you have the right weather conditions. So those fungi are out there free already. You just need the right weather conditions. Yeah. Now I know that down in the Jackson area, in, in August, they got about three, I'd say three and a half inches of rain that we didn't get here. Did that uh, have the same result with the aphids down there? You wanted to know if, if in Jackson, where they had more rain, what, in August, do, do they have? Do they? Do, did we have the same result? Everywhere I looked in Michigan, we had aphid populations on buckthorn, like I showed you on that first slide, and then every place I went later, I found no eggs. So the places I sampled, which is mostly central and southern Michigan, uh, where I know that there's buckthorn to, to go to, I haven't seen any eggs. We also had a, a guy from Illinois goes across the bottom half of Michigan on Highway 12, and he did his sampling in the fall, and he didn't find any eggs. Now up here, I'm not really sure, Martin would have to point me to a clump of buckthorn to, 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 to look at um, you know, further east here. And I don't think you have a lot of buckthorn here anyway. 